I'd like to introduce the topic of quality of life. And when we talk about quality of life, we're talking about family quality of life, not just quality of life of an individual, um, you know, one person in the family. And so um, we've got a great group of uh, folks up here. I think I'd like to just go down the line and let people do some intros, if we could have the mics up. And then I uh, have a couple of the, what we'll do format wise here is I've got just a real brief kind of set the stage talk. And then we've got so much experience up here that um, I think what we'd like to do is just open this up uh, for discussion and Q and A and resource sharing. So um, we'll, and we'll just go until they kick us out or everybody leaves. So um, no, we'll stick to our hour. So. Hi, good evening everyone. My name is Jamie Jackson. I'm a licensed psychologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, I work with both adolescents and adults, and I was lucky enough to be part of the carrier study that we've been doing at Nationwide Children's, and I've been working uh, with our carrier moms. I'm Denise Grender. For those of you who did not hear my talk this morning or I haven't already met with you, I guess I'm a BSer. Um, so that's after my name. I never finished um, going on for my master's because I started a school for children with special needs. And so working every day with children with delays in some sort might relate a lot to what you're dealing with at your house. I'm Eric Henriksen. I'm an assistant professor at the University of California, Davis in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab. And I'm, um, I've been in the Duchenne muscular dystrophy research world for about 20 years, working in various both outcome measure development, natural history studies, and now uh, looking at person reported outcomes and the intersection between mobility and participation in quality of life. And I'm James Poiskey. I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist, and I also have a son with Duchenne. I'm, I guess I'm on faculty at Baylor College of Medicine also. And I'm also the example of the what you should not do as a parent. Um, so I play many roles up here. I'm Rachel Poisky. I'm usually married to him. And uh, we have our son. He's 16 years old with Duchenne. And in my other part of my life, I am a Presbyterian pastor. And so this topic is really uh, just a passion of ours, is how do we live um, the Duchenne life well? So I'm glad to be here and be speaking about this. <laughs> and good afternoon, I'm Jessica Round. I'm a mom to Wyatt, who is almost 13, who has Duchenne. Um, and he's got a little brother who is almost 10. And I'm up here because we struggle with behavior issues and living the best life that we can with all of the behavior struggles and school struggles and normal life of trying to live Duchenne and everyone stay happy all day. Thanks very much. So I, oops, let's go that way. I'm a human development and child development guy. So in our field, we love models of ways to explain things and ways to how things interact. And um, I'm really pleased as a human development guy to see that the model that's being embraced by the Duchenne community is that you can see illustrated here in the, from the care considerations uh, papers really involves sort of the person with DMD, but also the family and care coordinators and co medical professionals from different disciplines um, all kind of focused around, if you notice, not just the individual, but the family as a whole. And that's what we're trying to talk about today. Um, this idea was kind of novel back in the 70s and 80s. A guy named Yuri Bronfenbrenner, who I liberally steal from um, and, and will today, uh, kind of got this idea of these changing family systems that change as people develop. And as you develop as parents, as your children develop as humans and in, you know, independent individuals, um, all of those things change over time. So all of these little relationships between all those little parts aren't fixed, they move and change over time as well. So one of the things that I wanted to, to talk about, many of your providers, and they're all wonderful people, we talk about, and even in clinical trials, we talk about quality of life forms. There's a lot of, a lot of forms to fill out. And quality of life, in many cases, what we've been doing in the neuromuscular world for a while now is saying, here, we want you to fill out these quality of life forms, and almost unilaterally, not entirely, but 
mostly we've been t asking you to fill out stuff that talks about or asking guys with DMD to fill out stuff that talks about mobility and your ability to move around and your ability to perform activities of daily living. We're calling that quality of life, but is mobility always, is that the definition of quality of life? I would argue that it's not. And especially, you know, we look at what we see from our Synergy Duchenne Natural History Study here. This is a group of, uh, this is data that we have on folks with uh, d varying degrees of mobility based on the, the PODC scale that you heard Dr. McDonald talk about earlier in the day. And then we look at the happiness scale from the same instrument. And I would argue that happy is a little more related to quality of life than mobility is. Um, you can see that actually the happiness part doesn't really change with mobility that much. So what does that mean? Well, maybe mobility isn't directly equal to quality of life. So what does impact quality of life. This is the thing that we need to think about. Maybe the idea is, and this is another model, you have strength, and strength is related to mobility, and mobility is in part related to participation in daily activities, and maybe it's that that participation in daily activities, that's what leads to what we define often just in the regular world as quality of life. So there are other parts to this. What are other things that can in impact individuals' participation? Okay, we've got strength, we've got fatigue, we've got mobility, we've got health items, but there's so much more than that. Um, we talked a bit uh, this morning about behavior, and this is actually one of the things for many families that, and we're talking about uh, you know, here today, is, is one of the challenges is for younger kids, sometimes behavior is very, very challenging to work with. Um, so how does that impact quality of life? Well, we know there's dystrophin in brain. We know that um, the that, uh, loss of the dystrophin protein affects not just strength, but also different, it creates a, a pattern of behaviors uh, that we commonly see, not all of them, but some of them, uh, in little constellations in people with DMD. And this can be sort of the socio-emotional delay, and this can be a challenge of you know people not quite acting their age or what, people, what, what parents would expect children to do or, or other people in the community would expect in terms of kids acting their age. Um, emotional outbursts, anxiety, behavioral rigidity, attention, compulsive behaviors, um, and this social disinterest or social withdrawal that is maybe in part because of lack of mobility, but is also in part um, can be related to sort of social drive to interact with peers. So this can create a challenge, and what, does it cre all, what do all these things create a challenge with? Participation. So this can lead to a mismatch between your expectations of what you want to do in life and what's actually happening. And this is the impact on quality of life that we see. So at least in part, this combination of mobility-related things and then socio-emotional things, that is one of the big determinants that we think of that can impact quality of life on not just an individual with DMD, but also the family. So this is what we sort of think about here in terms of challenges for the family. We've got challenges for caregivers. Here's the list. We just kind of threw this out in discussions the other day. What are some of the challenges that we have re related to quality of life um, that happen within the family for caregivers, for parents, you know, physical stress and fatigue and emotional stress, this idea of um, grief or sort of chronic sorrow, um, worrying about the future, financial stress, not having time to get everything done. Time management is a huge issue. We put a lot of pressure on families to do all these follow-up appointments and things that we have people go to. Um, and being able to learn to manage or deal with that regular disruption in, in people's lives. Um, and also this idea of role expectations of, you know, as a parent, what do you see your role is? What are you doing now in terms of taking care of your child with DMD or children with DMD relative to other children or your family members or other folks in the family who expect you to interact with them? So there are, def there are pressures from the rest of the family group and from the outside world that can lead to sort of a mismatch. Siblings, similar issues. Less time with parents. Uh, we talked about this quite a bit earlier this morning. Uh, again, role expectations. 
uh, worry and stress and grief in SIBs. Um, and also, independence and autonomy. This can be potentially more or less. I've heard a bunch of people say today, well, you know, so-and-so's siblings, they're great, they really do a lot of stuff on their own, and, you know, that can be a challenge, but that can also be a really good way to learn independence and become, uh, learn autonomy and become a resilient person as an adult. So that's a balance. Extended family, same thing. Um, so we have all these reciprocal relationships we're talking about. And we can look at them as individual stressors, or we can kind of look at this whole pattern and realize that, and I think we see a lot of uh, examples of this here, families can be really amazing supportive teams. And so there are opportunities here, opportunities to share and discuss feelings and worries and anxieties to f focus on the health and wellness of the entire family as a group, building resilience and autonomy and self-confidence. Um, and if you ask, there, there's a literature, there's a, there's a field, people actually study what the benefits are of having sort of chronic serious diseases and the, what are the benefits that come from having those kind of diagnoses. And it sounds completely contradictory, but, um, but people do find positive things in being a part of a, a, a family where a serious medical diagnosis exists um, in terms of developing closer and more meaningful relationships, learning to share responsibilities, resources, focus on what they feel is important in life um, instead of what society always what society tells you ought to be important, um, being able to advocate for each other and feel power in being an advocate. Um, and sharing and searches for resources as well. So this is where we get, okay, so now we've got the family as a unit, and this is where I start to steal from Dr. Bronfenbrenner from the 80s. Um, but we have the community around. This is where the resources live, and this is also where some of that support for the family can come from. You've got employers. You've got healthcare resources, school resources, um, recreational groups and activities. That's one of the things a lot of people say, we just don't have time to do leisure time stuff and you know, really get out and recreate the way we'd like to. There are ways to do that. It is definitely challenging. Um, nobody's gonna say that that's just an easy road to walk, but in terms of finding resources that are available for individuals, kids, families, soccer games, things like that with siblings, um, scouts with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, guys, you know, church groups, things like that. Um, it is, those are out there. There are also state and federal government resources, health insurance coverage, disability programs, advocates at that level, um, advocacy organizations, peer support, um, care guidelines, etc. So this then becomes our web, right, that can be used. It can feel overwhelming at first, especially to look at all these things and go, oh my gosh, how am I going to put all of these pieces together? Um, and that's actually what we exist for as part of the web as well, is to help people, help families identify those resources and start to tie them together because it's not just the family as a team, it's all of us as a team trying to work for the benefit of the community at large in addition to individuals. So we really do work to try to help people identify resources that will help the family um, as a whole. Um, so we've got this supportive web and it's been touched on numerous times today that supportive web the, the resources that are used, the parts that kind of carry the most weight, the web doesn't actually change that much, right? The, pad, the, the things that are out there, they're, they're reasonably fixed. But how people use them and when they're needed for any individual specific family can change over time. So there's this constant learning process. There are the need, the, you, family has needs, there are resources out there. And the, constant theme here is change. That as you go through life, as you go through life as a family, the family needs 
differ, and so you're in this constant learning process. You're not learning everything all at once. For some of you right now being new to this community, you might feel like you're trying to learn everything all at once, and you don't have to. Um, but you can learn from peers and get the little pieces that you need now, and don't worry about feeling overwhelmed by everything in the entirety as a whole, as a whole because these are the parts, there are parts that might not be relevant to you right now. Know they're there, there are resources to get you hooked up with them, that's what the web and the community does. So that's enough of my soapbox. Um, this is the discussion part. I just wanted to kind of intro this. I think a lot of you have questions and concerns, and we've got our panelists here, and we'd like to, I think, open it up to questions. Yeah. And it's OK if you're shy. So if we don't have questions directly from the audience, I think what it would be interesting to hear some of the concerns, especially from parents um, who have volunteered to be on the panel here, because uh, I think that's what you were talking about the other day it was really um, important and enlightening. Sorry. Well, I think you know one of the things we just wanted to do with this panel was normalize everything, normalize what you're experiencing, uh, particularly in behavior. Uh, if you're on any of the Facebook groups, on an almost daily basis, someone is posting about their child and behavior, and is this related to Duchenne? And I just wanna go on every single time and say, yes, yes, yes. Um, it's part of what we live with. And for us, I know that um, the physical stuff is hard, Definitely, but um, the behavior is what brings the chaos to our family and trying to work through that and deal with that on a daily basis and trying to figure out what resources can we have. And on top of that, then trying to work with your child to manage their behavior so that they can become a productive, independent adult. Um, one of the things we talk about a lot is that uh, our kids with Duchenne often lag behind socially. They lag behind um, just in their uh, development. So you may be sitting with a 16-year-old and in reality, you're working with a 12-year-old, right, or 13-year-old, and that gets difficult sometimes because you want them to do 16-year-old things instead of 12-year-old things. Um, so that's one thing that I think is so important for all of us is to normalize and say not every child with Duchenne struggles with behavior, but many children do, with Duchenne do, and that may be a result of their anxiety, their depression, their ADD. All those things play into, and just to be aware, this is part of the family dynamic that causes stress on us every single day. I say to my son, I said, I would help you all day long if you just wouldn't be a jerk to me. Am I the only one? Okay, great. You know, and so I'm um, just trying to name that and say, you're bringing this to our family and how do we deal with it and work through it? And I, if I can add to that, sorry. Um, I think it's also trying to be on the same page in how we're addressing things and how we're approaching things. And, and um, you know, I think just because we can have differences of opinions, and spoiler alert, I'm usually wrong. <laughs> um, but but approaching things as a team, it can be really challenging because you know you're in the situation where um, you're having these repetitive behaviors occur, and despite having professional training or not, like they still happen. And so you know, coming up with an approach that both of you agree upon, but then also is realistic in doing. Like, it's, it's one thing to say, oh, well, we both have to be patient, and we have to be strategic, and we have to say this, and, and then I, I lose it in like the first 30 seconds and totally <laughs> undercut whatever plan we had. But, but that in and of itself can be a source of stress and, and um, uh, contribute to the chaos. And it can be a real challenge to approach it as a team and to remember that we're a team, and we're not against each other, but we're on the same page. Um, I'm going to piggyback on you and say what also, as a family, like a, your immediate family unit, your outside, your in-laws, your, you know, everybody else in the community can watch you, and if your kids 
acting like, and everybody's going, oh my God, oh my gosh, why is he acting like that? And you want to go hide, and you're like, but I know how to parent my child. I know what helps him, even though I'm still yelling and going, okay, take it back. But how do you do that and cope with the looks? And I think that's, that's something that everybody you read online is going, oh my gosh, what do I do? And so I think it's just us getting out here and talking about it. I asked Ryan last year, I'm like, we need to talk about behavior. It is all over our Facebook page. Everybody's talking about it, but not, we're not talking about it out loud with everybody. So we can figure out how do you cope and get through it. So I don't, I think questions are starting. How do you want to do that? So, so just to restate the question for the folks who are listening, the, the, the question uh, in, in brief was that, that MDA Canada is working with the Canadian health system to look at the impact of um, a DMD diagnosis in a family on sibling development as well, which is a fascinating question and something I think a lot of people in this room are very concerned about. Let's see. I'll take it. Sure. <laughs> I, I think that's a really big thing because, uh, you know, the siblings feel like there's so much going on here that a lot of times I think they suppress things or they say, I have to be the good kid. And I think a really important part is to name in your family that things are different. At least I found that for, you know, our daughter to say, this is a different situation and to let them know that so that they have, you know, they need vocabulary for Duchenne as much as a child with Duchenne needs vocabulary to be able to say, this is how I'm feeling and include them in all of it. Um, and then have, you know, special time for them. And sometimes that means your Duchenne child doesn't, doesn't get what they want at that moment that it's not about them. You know, I had to skip something very important one time for our Duchenne child because it was meet the teacher for my daughter. And I think it was an interview even for his school or something, but I had promised her I would be there. And I said, you know what? I can't go to your thing. And that's really hard because we always go to their thing. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I've got to go to her thing. And sometimes you have to go to the siblings thing. I was going to say, we, we try to, in our family, try to give the little guy his own special day. So even for this trip, Winston, our youngest, is like, I want to go to SeaWorld. I want to go. I want to go. And, and it's like, okay. So just him and I are going to go. And just to give him that little block of time that's just his because he's here and it's all about Wyatt. So, you know, I think you got to carve out that time as hard as it is to give them just that little bit of attention. I've got a 14-year-old grandson and the 11-year-old brother got upset because they changed bedrooms and so we had a double bed and then we gave the 11-year-old a blow-up bed because we hadn't gotten the other bed yet. So. He's on a blow-up bed, and he's, I mean, he's really thinking it's kind of funny anyway. But then Grandma bought him uh, a Carter, the Duchenne, the, our grandson that has Duchenne, bought him a mechanical bed. So got it delivered, put it up and everything, surprised him when he came home, and the 11-year-old goes, oh, great. I'm on the blow-up. He gets the new bed. And I was like, you looked at the bed, right? You understand the bed, right? Well, yeah, but he got the new one, and it's, it was a cushy, and it was pretty cool. And I said, okay, then let's have an opposite day. So we're going to have an opposite day where you have to do everything that Carter does. Now, we know Carter's not going to be able to do everything that you can do, but you are going to have to do everything Carter does, which means I'm going to get you out of bed in the morning, I'm going to change your clothes, I'm going to bring the urinal to the bed. We're going to do it all and we'll have an opposite day. Kind of thought about it, and then let it go. But every once in a while now, since that conversation, if something comes up, either one of them will say to the other one, are we doing opposites today? 
<laughs> and it does kind of lighten the mood mm -hmm. because he has been. Can you go get this? Can you go get that? Can you do this? Well, why can't he do it? Well, truthfully, we kind of started to baby Carter and say, you know, well, but he could have. He could have taken his dishes to the sink. Because, but he's in his chair, but he still could have taken his dishes to the sink. But we kind of let him leave his, but the other one has to take his. So it kind of gives you a realization that you got to keep making sure that you hold the child with Duchenne accountable as well and not cut him. Because Mommy and I had a discussion last week. She goes, uh, I think we're a little spoiling on him. And I'm like, well, yeah, I know, but that's my job. You're supposed to be the bad guy. <laughs> and she goes, I know, but come on. So it, it, it kind of helped. And every once in a while, like I said, he can go back to saying, let's have an opposite day. And it just lightens the mood. It's, it's not unusual, um, and we've heard this from friends as well, and, and our daughter said this at one point, it's not unusual for siblings to say, I wish I had muscular dystrophy at some point um, because of doctor's visits and it feels like they're getting so much attention. and they and have to go to school. What's mm -hmm. that? They miss school a lot. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, that's definitely out there. Um, and I, I think it, it's, I think I'd mentioned this earlier, it, it, it's difficult as a parent, you know, because you know no matter what you do, one of your kids is going to take 90% of your parenting energy and effort and focus and all that, you know, for better or for worse. And no matter how good a parent you are, it's still, there's just not enough to go around in equal measures. And I think that, that as parents, we feel some guilt about that sometimes. Um, at least I know that I do. Um, and I, th I think also, too, like sometimes that causes some resentment towards the other child, um, as well as, like Rachel had said, if like you're putting in 90% of your effort and energy, and then they're also being a jerk to you at the same time. It's like it can be really tough sometimes. And I think we just wanted to acknowledge that it, it's okay if you're feeling that way. Like that's something that, that we need to talk about and, and get out there. That it, that is a, it's, it's something that we all probably experience to varying degrees. Yeah, I, I can speak a little bit to that too. So there's a couple of things I think I want to mention from the carrier study that I think kind of elucidates this point. Um, so as part of the carrier study, um, with Pat and Kathy's suggestion, I'm so glad that they did, we included a qualitative interview for all the moms who came into the study and we asked them questions about um, what it was like as a caregiver and some of the stressors of being a caregiver. Um, we also asked about what it meant um, to be a carrier for those who knew their carrier status. And uh, many women did identify guilt um, for you know, having this carrier status, that I somehow did this to my child. Now, a lot of those women also understood that that's not necessarily a rational thought, and that at the time that they obviously had their son, that that wasn't some knowledge that they actually had possession of at that time. But I, I think it's important for me to state that, because I, I, that is not an uncommon experience. And I think we should all recognize that you know, it's also OK. You can acknowledge it's not a rational thought, but that it's a thought that people do have, and that's understandable. But the second, I mean, as far as why they would initially have that thought, but um, I think the other, the other thing from the carrier study that I also want to mention that this gentleman brought up was that about 41% of the women in our study had clinically elevated symptoms of anxiety. And that's really concerning. Um, and I think he makes a great point that there is a trickle-down effect on the family when caregivers, and so I'm also going to include dads, not just moms in that, but when either caregiver is experiencing significant emotional distress. And that's where I also wanted to bring up, and um, we've got another question here, so I'll wait to bring up this question, but I'm actually interested in some of what our other panelists think about um, uh, you know, as far as making sure that we're taking care of ourselves as caregivers during this process, but prioritizing addressing our own mental health concerns, um, not just for ourselves, but actually for our family in addition to ourselves, and making sure that becomes a priority as well. So. Um, hi, my name is Anna, and um, I have an eight-year-old son who just finished second grade. And a lot of the behaviors you're discussing, he exhibits some of them too. He's on steroids. He's kind of a, a really happy, giggly kid and pretty hyper, I guess, in general. So that just exacerbates it. And then this last year in school, as school gets harder, 
and there's more things to learn and more things to pay attention with. He's having a more difficult time with behavior. And this last year, I don't know if this wasn't a good idea, but he had two different teachers that like split the week. So it wasn't very consistent and it wasn't, didn't go very well in that respect. And does anyone have any tips on how to work with your child about, because when the school calls and tells me, well, he's not paying attention, he's not doing this, he's goofing around, he's tracking mud into the school making, and playing army guys in the mud during recess. It's hard to know how do you deal with the school and then how do you manage the behavior with your child? Because I work and we have, I have two sons with muscular dystrophy and I'm a carrier, so that stress and everything you're talking about also plays into my life too. And it's very difficult to know, like I love my son and I want him to do well in school, but how do we deal with those behaviors? It's really hard. Well, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> so we've struggled with school since first grade. I mean, kindergarten was the beginning, but first grade, when those phone calls started, I saw that phone number from the school and it was just, my gut would drop every time. And I just knew what they were calling about. And still to this day, he's looking at me over there going, oh no. Um, <laughs> he's going into seventh grade and I still get those phone calls. But um, it's a lot of, we, I already talked to the vice principal about scheduling a meeting with his teachers before school starts. And we meet with the teachers, we go over everything. I bring the PPMD packet of what it is, all, eight, all for his age group highlighted, um, and we talk to him about it. And then two months in, they forgot all the things that I told them every single year. And my husband and I go there and we talk to them again. And he knows, and it's, it's finding the right teachers, it's finding the consistency, and when they know and you can just we, we've done so many things. I just try to think of all of them of like lists of that they know exactly what's going to happen when they're little like that, that they know what their day looks like. I found changing teachers or half days were the worst. And we knew it before the day started. We'd have the teachers text us if they weren't coming in that day so we could prep them. So, I mean, that's some of the things, consistency, 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 and when you find the people who are really good with them, pray that they'll get to keep them. So. I, I think everyone should have their Duchenne, have full neuropsych eval for their um, Duchenne child. And that's not just to know your weaknesses, but their weaknesses, but that's to know their strengths. Um, you know, what I found out when we did our sons is uh, he's so verbal. And I thought, okay, we can work with this. His math, he's, you know, Th horrible. That means he doesn't stop talking. That's true. <laughs> that, is, that is accurate. But that full evaluation helps you know more, get inside their brain. Don't you just want to get inside their brain? And that helps you a little bit, I think, at least for us, to be inside his brain and know where his strengths lie, where his weaknesses lie. And then also, you know, I just take a stack of Starbucks cards and just pass them out like money to all the teachers. Make, um, it, ra make it rain. Make it rain. Make yeah. it rain Starbucks gift cards. But I do think that, the, you know, just what Jessica was talking about, going ahead of them and kind of prepping them and knowing, getting them on your team, on your side, and giving them knowledge. This may be the first Duchenne child they've ever had. And, you know, it's... Our son was really good at um, faking everybody out. It, he would pretend like he knew what he was doing, and then he'd sneak off to the bathroom for an hour when he didn't understand what was happening in the class. And they'd say, he just runs off. I'm like, he has no idea what you're talking about. And they said, yes, he does. I'm like, trust me, he doesn't. But, um, you know. He, he says he does. Yeah, he says he does. <laughs> But they didn't. They don't know what to do with them because it's. Uh, they've got a lot of times learning, a lot of times attention, you know, a lot of times anxiety, and, and then on top of it, physical. So you have to go ahead and really be their advocate and go ahead of the school year. I think what she said is just great. And, and I would say, and I think this is probably more as a professional than as a parent, but um, be aggressive when you're addressing behavior and learning problems. Um, I, I see a lot of people who put them off and put them off or kind of do a little bit here, a little bit there, and then things snowball over time. So I, I, I know people don't like to hear this, and I don't mean this in a cavalier sort of way, but like if you've got to think about medicine, do medicine. If you've got to have a behavior plan, like pretty formal behavior plan, 
put a behavior plan in place. If you need an IEP, put an IEP in place. Like do everything, not just necessarily a little bit here and a little bit there. Because you can always back off down the road if you need to. It's just real hard to play catch up if you're already kind of behind the eight ball. Also, as the children grow out of our program and move into a regular school or a special needs school or any kind of program, we really encourage that they come back to us and we become their child advocate to go to a school. My daughter had health um, issues as a child. I never went to a doctor appointment without some family nurse or friend so that I could understand the medical side. Same thing with education. There are retired teachers out there. There's a neighbor that's a teacher that can go with you and can kind of stand up for you and fight for your rights of, of what you deserve in that classroom, help you explain it, and help a program get started. Sometimes teachers just need to know, sometimes we don't need to call moms. Moms are, moms are done. Could they handle it in school? We have to go to the principal and we have to just sit for an hour and cool off and then go back into class. We work all kinds of things before we call that parent. So behavior plans that go between home and school and iPads and extra special time, it all sometimes works together to just help, especially if we started on the younger end. I would like oh. to, is this working? Um, I'd like to know if kids kind of grow out of it. Uh, I don't know if you've all seen The Omen. My son is Damien. <laughs> um, <laughs> he absolutely is. He can be cute as a button, but, you know, then look out. Um, I've mostly stopped using the cattle prod, but we have used every, everything else. And it's a lot of it is really working. We have him now, he's 11, he's now in a, um, a partial hospitalization program that's in the public school system. So between that and medication and some really hard ass relatives and friends, it's getting better. We had hospitalized him twice for behavior when he was young. We don't hide the knives anymore, and sadly that one I'm not kidding about. Um, but, you know, can I expect that it will get better with age? Or is it, you know, more dependent on the uh, different approaches we're taking? I'd like to hope it gets better with age. I mean, why it's 13, it's, it's gotten better. We, we are on a lot of different meds to help him cope with it. But I don't know if there's anybody older than our guys out there who have really seen it get a lot better. So I'll open that up to you guys. I, I'm sorry, I don't want to oh, dominate all the conversation. But um, I, I would say um, in general, yes, but it depends. I mean, I, I think in general, the, the more comprehensive you are with uh, putting different interventions and treatments and supports in place, that's going to increase the likelihood. Because it's not 100% guaranteed that everybody gets better. Um, I think probably there are degrees of better, and I think that to some extent it's also a bit of a fluctuating road where you know, things may get better, but then you have situations where you run into a stressful situation like at school or something like that, and then things kind of devolve, um, and then you're trying to put it back together. And then we do better, a little bit better, um, but then you run across a rough patch again where things kind of devolve. And so it's, 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 it's not like a steady kind of uh, linear increase over time. I think it's more variable than that. And I think sometimes two things kind of change over time. And so with younger kids, you might see more problems with explosive outbursts and meltdowns and like the real rigid, it's got to be the way I think it should be just because that's the way I think it should be. Whereas when they get older, you might run across more problems with like depression or something like that. So I, I think in general, things do tend to get better. Um, I think it's, there's always reason to be hopeful and to look forward towards what comes down the road. I think at the same time, you know, the other message is I never want people to be complacent because of that, and obviously you're not, um, and, and you know that very well. Um, you can't, you, also, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you just kind of cross your fingers and, and hope that it would get better, and then it doesn't, and then that's where you're at. That's, you know, so again, kind of do everything you can, and in most cases, it does help over time. So, yep. 
Yes, I, I, you guys have just touched on 90% of why I walked up to this podium. <laughs> Um, um, the neuropsych uh, evaluation, um, the, um, the siblings, um, and this lady, this young lady over here just hit the nail on the head. Um, I have a son who, who is the most sweetest, kindest boy in the history of the world, according to his teachers. Then he gets in the car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the minute he gets in the car, the bear comes up. And the bear is mean. He's, it's, he's, it's a big he's, bear. He's, he's, he's yeah. A, yeah. And so we have a saying in the car, let the bear out. And we all scream to the top of our lungs. Be, I'm the caregiver of both my son, who has Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and my 10-year-old daughter. Um, and so when they get in the car, it goes from how was your day to stop kicking my chair, stop doing this, stop doing that. So the bear starts instantly. And then I go to his meetings for his IEP meetings and I get nothing but praise from all his mm -hmm. teachers and we're all in therapy except my wife who's in the medical field who doesn't believe in therapy um, so that's, <laughs> that's another that's a story for another day we hide the kitchen knives from her all right so um, but uh, but me my daughter and my son all see a therapist we see a psychiatrist and we all communicate together as a team. Me, my daughter, and my son are a team. My wife works a lot. She's in the medical field. She has four jobs. That's her way of dealing with things. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the way I look at it, that's the way she's going to explode someday. And I hate to see it when it's going to happen. But like I, like I said, you guys hit, as I walked up here, you guys hit like four or five different things that I wanted to talk about. So I appreciate you. Everything yeah. you guys are doing, I, I thank you very yeah. much. Thank, Can I thank talk? you for for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to address the bear. Um, you know, I I think that our son does that too. I think sometimes their anxiety, they can hold it in. You know, they everybody say, "Oh, he's so quiet." I'm like, "Oh, you don't know." Yeah. He's so sweet. Yeah. What? What? How, what? He doesn't uh, act that I'm way like, at home. Who? What name are you referring to? But no. But. The anxiety, they can hold it in, and then it's like they explode, you know. And, and one of the other things I think that uh, calms the bear sometimes is uh, eating. I know that sounds a little, but we, we've really learned that... Um, hangry. Hangry, hangry is, is, a, a thing. is real. Yeah. And pro, I know this, I feel stupid saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's uh, protein every two hours really helps our son just, you know... Even he would come home from school and start throwing things, and I'm, like, behind the door putting food out like a dog. Uh -huh. You know, I'm, like, just here, just here, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like, um, like the alligators yeah. with the chicken on a stick, you, <laughs> you know, know, you're, like. <laughs> just one bite, just one bite. And, and then he'd be, like, oh, I had a great day. And I'm, like, but, but his blood sugar, that was a, that was a big deal for, for us. Um, so that the hangry issue, I think that that's not that doesn't solve all behavior problems, but it has made our life easier. Just the very first thing when he the bear comes out, I say, "Have you? When is the last time you've actually eaten?" And I'm it, not hungry. Yeah. That's like the classic yeah. response. And, oh, I had yeah, I had marshmallows. No, that's not going to work. So that's, anyway. that's the yeah. same thing in our house, and it's like I'm chasing him around with peanut butter, going, mm -hmm. "You need to eat," and he's like, "I'm not hungry," and then he eats, and he goes. Oh, thank you, Mom. I'm so sorry. And he can pull it all together. And also, I just wanted to say, sometimes just when he's out the box, that if you just hold them, like help them pull it all together. And I find, because he's crying and yelling, and I'm crying and yelling, and sometimes it's just, you just go and bear hug, him, bear hug the bear. <laughs> and, and then you can just feel this calmness. And then you look at each other and go, okay, now let's talk about it and figure it out and eat the peanut butter, you know? So I think that you find those little things and you forget them in the, in the heat of the moment, but some, you'll, it'll come to you just to get to that calmness for a minute. Okay, so my son is two and a half. We found out whenever he was seven months, freak accident, finding out. Um, but we struggle with figuring out whether he is a normal two and a half year old with his tantrums and behaviors, biting being one of them and slapping occasionally. But we struggle knowing that. And then y'all mentioned, 
mentioned getting a neuropsych eval. Is two and a half too young for that? And how would we go about that? Because, I mean, we talk to the doctors. They all think his speech is fine. They all say, oh, he's normal. So w where do we start or when? So, so I think one of the things, and I, I think that is a commonly held belief amongst providers um, these days is that sort of watch and wait approach to the preschool age. Ah, uh, they're terrible twos anyway. And he's just a boy. He's being a boy. And they're a, yes, exactly. And one of the things that we're seeing, and we've actually, and Dr. Wagner presented some of her uh, information earlier today, um, we're definitely seeing that even on the uh, very young child uh, assessments of behavior and um, in child development, that we see areas of difference in many guys with DMD um, as early as you know six months, uh, even earlier in terms of milestone development, in terms of social interaction, in terms of um, challenging behaviors, things like that. So there are assessment tools that are available for children in those age ranges. That is something that is a little bit, it's sort of touched on very briefly in, in, in the care guidelines as they're out now, but many of us are really advocating for getting kids in as soon as, as close as possible to diagnosis um, to start getting those kinds of behavioral evaluations done. Because what it does is if you are get if you are able to identify areas where the kids can use some extra help, it, the, it sets them up to, it sets you up to be able to get them into the pipeline where services are available to help to address those issues. And the earlier you can do that, the better it sets them up to go into the preschool environment, into the school environment, establish a record of care in those areas, and really get them to a point where it's kind of the, you know optimized for them to do their best with uh, you know social interactions with peers and teachers and you as parents. And so um, that's. You, we tend to say get them in as quickly as you can, and if you have trouble locating resources, um, that you know PPMD is great in, in terms of helping people identify those resources locally. If, if I could just add to that real quick, also, um, and I tell this to all parents, like if if your parent intuition, if your spider sense is tingling, if your parent intuition is is telling you that something feels different, or that we're just not sure about something, don't ignore that. Um, and I mean, at, at that age, you're not going to have like a traditional neuropsych eval, uh, but you still have developmental assessments and you have, you know, emotional regulation is a part of development and there can be delays in that area in as much as there can in other areas too. So I, yeah, uh, the earlier the better. Uh, and there are things that can be evaluated and there are things that can, can help. So I, I wouldn't ignore that kind of that concern. Can I add one comment to that? Just from my earlier comment, um, phenomenal. But we've had probably five people in the last, as you and I were talking about this earlier, that go early and get a diagnosis very generic because people don't want to label them. And it's very frustrating for us at our school because we can see it, we know what it is, but they won't label them. So I do think it's recommended that you try to get with one of the PPMD, one of the organizations that can tell you where to go, that, will, that knows what we're all dealing with, because when they don't know a Duchenne kid, they don't, un they don't understand it and they don't wanna do it. So stick within the communities and ask for help from the PPMD office. It's, it's very, very helpful. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just I wanted to say real quickly, thank you all for addressing um, the issue of behaviors and uh, the aspect uh, that I, I think a lot of people ignore. I know, um, I'll, I'll full disclosure, James Poisky is one of my best friends in this community. I don't say that very often, but uh, e even I used to walk out of the room when it changed uh, from uh, talking about the research to talking about behaviors. I, I didn't really want to listen to James that badly, but um, 
as my son Sam is, is 17, and as he's lost physical uh, capabilities, that's obviously uh, stressful, but uh, today behavior and some of those things are um, even more important to us, I think, going back to the talk about um, quality of life and things like that. Those are the things that are really important to Sam. So um, for some of you all that have younger um, kids and just think about mobility and things like that, uh, as your kids get older, it's it's really critically important. But um, I did actually have a question and, and, and something I'd like to, to hear you all talk about, just the element of stress, um, uh, both on the the boys, um, but also on families too. I'm the proud owner of two heart attacks. Uh, I'm pretty physically fit, but I think stress has a lot to do with, with that. Um, and if you all have thought about that, and uh, as as to how it affects um, you know behaviors and quality of life. Therapy, therapy, therapy. Um, I mean, we we've all like. I don't remember who was saying it earlier, but we're, we're all seeing a counselor because I think stress gets out of control and you can only talk to each other so much about the same thing and giving it to someone else for one hour and laying it all out on them and being able to walk away and have a glass of wine and is, is awesome for yourself. And then both of our boys are now seeing therapists and counselors and and it's just something that they can go and have their time to get whatever they have off their chest. And I think, because I think everybody has stress at home and at work and everything else. And just to be able to lay it out for somebody else to take it on for an hour has been life changing for me. I think self-care, you, you have to find something that's yours and you have to put a boundary around that. You know, there's a reality show I like to watch. I won't say what it is. <laughs> but I locked the door, and for an hour, my son would do Shen, who wants to talk to us. He's very verbal and, he, he, you know, thinks the whole entire world revolves around him. I lock him out for an hour, and I say, unless you're, you are, you've broken something, call dad, but if he doesn't pick up, then find me. But, um, you know, I, you know, you have to find ways, you have to carve out time for yourself. We are in a marathon. We are not in a sprint. And I'm excited about all these therapies that are happening, but that means for good, it's good, but we're in the marathon for a lot longer, which is exciting and good and hard. And so you have got to find something that is yours and you have to you know, put a boundary around it and say, it's my time. And frankly, your Duchenne child needs you to see, see you doing that. And it helps them to know that the world doesn't revolve around them all the time. They need that. They, because I think sometimes I know our child struggles. I mean, I say you're entitled <laughs> because, you know, everybody brings him things and gives him random toys, you know, and the siblings sitting there like, why is he getting a stuffed animal at the airport from a stranger? I'm like, he's in a wheelchair. Please do it. I can't help it. You know, but, um, but there's a certain entitlement. He's like, why don't I, you know, he thinks he always gets to go to the front of the line because he usually does. And that it's just an interesting dynamic. But self-care also teaches them that you have needs. And that's part of their process, too. They need to learn that, that as you care for them, you have needs that you have to take care of. And I, I totally agree with that, and I would also add to that too that, um, you know, in in as much as you're in a marital or, or partner relationship too, that also takes a lot of care and nurturing, and really has to be a priority because it's it's easy, like I'd mentioned before, it's easy to battle against each other rather than kind of on the same team. Or I think even easier is just it's easy to kind of neglect it because you get busy and you get caught up in all the different things that you have going on and. Um, that really, you have to go out of your way to really continue to care for that because there's extra stress put upon that and kind of, you know, I think in a situation like Duchenne, Duchenne will bring out, if, there, if there's any sort of underlying or inherent weaknesses in your relationship, Duchenne will pull those out and magnify them times 100. And so you really have to uh, make that a priority um, because you can really, that can be a huge source of support and, and comfort, but at the same time, you can't neglect it or else it can fall apart. So. 
Just one other thing. I think we as families, you know, we're in such survival mode. And in survival mode, you think, oh, I don't have to worry about my marriage. I don't have time for that because I'm in survival mode. But we have to somehow flip and say, we're not going to be just in survival mode anymore. We're going to live. And that may mean, you know, for us, it's like going on a date night two minutes from home. So if he calls, we're back in two minutes. You know, but that that's okay. Um, but we have to somehow as a community move from survival to, to thriving and not let Dushan hijack our lives, but say, how are we going to live and be joyful in the midst? I was going to say something really quickly. Um, so two things, while I'm really sorry about your, the physical experience that you had with having as much stress, I, I also appreciate that you brought that point up because once again, I think there not only is a tremendous physical demand by being a caregiver and the things that you do as a caregiver, but also that chronic stress over time does place wear and tear on our bodies in other ways as well. And so I'm just, I'm glad you highlighted that because I hope that also shows others the importance of ensuring that we are prioritizing this time. But the other thing I wanted to ask, and this is kind of bouncing off of a question that was asked earlier, one thing that I've heard a lot from moms is like, yeah, yeah, I get that I'm supposed to prioritize these things, but how? I don't have time to prioritize these things. I don't literally have time. And so I would love to hear what the panelists think about that. So this brings to mind an eye-opening conversation that I had a few years back. And it, it, when we talk about self-care, one of the things that we are also really trying to foster here with talking about behavior management and regulation and you know, in our teens with DMD and our young adults is that you know, a lot of these guys are going to have to master adult roles at some point. And I was having a, uh, we were in the, in the process of doing a study looking at how parents and the guys with DMD rate their own mobility and ability to do certain tasks around the house. And the mom answered this one questionnaire, teen with DMD answered the same questionnaire separately, and then we got them together and we compared answers. Well, why did you answer this this way if this answer was different than this one? And we had a young man who was saying that he could do a, whole bu a lot of these things. And mom said, he can't do a lot of these things. And we got them together and we created a discussion and said, okay, let's, let's talk about why these are different. And she said, you can't do X, Y, Z. And it was a whole list of kind of around the house daily activities um, that didn't require a lot of strength. They were more motivational and things that you, you could potentially do with his level of strength, but she said he didn't. And he looked at her and he said, well, mom, I know that you can't really do anything to make me better, and I know that it really makes you feel good to help me. And so I let you do those things. And of course, then we had a half an hour of tears on both sides as they talked this out. And I was just, I was amazed. And they came back for a second study visit two weeks later. and. We went through the whole process again. We're calibrating these instruments. And I said, so how are things going? And mom said, you know, he can do these things. <laughs> and he said, yeah, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do them more because I actually kind of like this stuff. I can do a lot of things myself that I didn't think that I wanted to do. And I, I can be a little independent. And it was really amazing to have that conversation it was eye-opening because nobody in the room when we started thought that there was any other way to do things. And mom ended up, not with a great deal of free time, but more time on her hands to focus on other things. And those are the kinds of things that reduce stress on the family and help to build skills for guys who might be getting a little used to people doing everything for them. Um, there are points in the world where you know, they're going to need to go out and have some adult roles. So self-care is for everybody. It's for the whole family. Sir, there's a question over here. I think, how are we doing for time right now? OK, this is our last question. I'll keep it brief, but I just wanted to shine a different perspective. Because um, everybody's been talking about their children. But my older brother has Duchenne's, and he's 33. And I'm currently his full-time caretaker. 
But the reason why is because when I was younger, my mom made sure that I had time for myself away from him and away from um, not making it seem too much like it was all about Ryan. Um, but furthermore, and uh, Mary hit on this earlier, but um, there, one thing that my parents did was they, they made it clear that when he needed help, it wasn't like, I, it, it was never pressured or guilt, but it was something that um, just hopefully your children will recognize that if, some, if he's struggling, you should have some compassion. It's never like put out the, take out the trash for him because of this. It's let them learn that on their own because you, you really want your children to be friends. And then that's where the, the brotherhood happens and sisterhood, whatever the term would be. That's where that happens first. And, um, but lastly, um, not to make this too sappy, but try to pay attention when your children are getting to an age, if there is a disparity in, in age difference, because Ryan's seven years older than me. So when I was in fifth grade, I remember coming across my sister's research paper, high school research paper on Duchenne muscular dystrophy and learning the mortalities, just reading it by myself. And I don't know when I told my parents or how, if I talked about that with anybody. But so just keep that in mind when your kids, how you tell them about this disease for their siblings and those effects and impacts. Hope that's helpful. Sharon. Thank you. No. Final remarks, anybody? We actually put things on the calendar. Like, this is my time, or we're going to have a date this night, which sounds very kind of, I don't know, overly programmed, but if you don't, it won't happen. So. Rachel, do you? Oh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'd like to thank my fellow panelists. Um, and uh, Ryan, I think you've got a couple of. Yeah, uh, we're going to have a couple of polling questions. Uh, if you weren't here earlier for the polling, this is the last three. And then we're sending you out for the vendor fair, the reception. Um, but this pertains to the conversation we had uh, in the last hour. So we feel it is important to ask them. Um, if you didn't poll before, it's pollev.com slash ppmd. Please log on so you can do the first polling question. Do you have concerns about behavior problems for the person with Duchenne or Becker that are more than typical for someone their age? Responses are not at all, somewhat, or very concerned. I'm going to give you a minute because I know I sprung the polling I on you last minute. I want you to repeat minute. the website. So pollev.com slash ppmd. <clears throat> yeah. And real time? <laughs> yeah, it's real time. It real time polling. Yeah. Do you have concerns about behavior problems for the person with Duchenne or Becker that are more than typical for someone their age? In case you can't see the screen. Okay. Majority are somewhat concerned. followed uh, closely behind. Uh, the two options are, are close, not at all, and very, um, but the majority are somewhat concerned. All right, let's do the next question. Do you have concerns about anxiety for the person with Duchenne or Becker that are more than typical for someone their age? Can I add something, Ryan? Yeah, by all means, just don't taint the question. <laughs> no, I'm clarifying the question. So one thing to keep in mind, what we see when kids have Duchenne is not necessarily that they have anxi anxiety in the classic sense where they're worrying about everything. It's more that they're easily stressed, easily overwhelmed, easily thrown off. Clarify. Thank you, James. Once again, seeing somewhat concerned and a uh, high response for very concerned. Okay, let's do the next question. Do you have concerns about depression for the person with Duchenne or Becker that are more than typical for someone their age?
And it doesn't mean they have to have been diagnosed. It's do you have concerns around this? This one was the highest on not at all concern, I noticed. It's followed by somewhat and still a decent amount, very concerned. Okay, and final question, and then I'll let you guys go. Do you have concerns about the level of stress currently on your family that are more than what you'd consider typical family stress levels? <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of these are reflecting what we heard in the conversation today, um, and also that there's a lot more work we need to do <coughs> with addressing these areas. Because uh, at the end of the day, this is what you go home to. This is what you live with. The clinical trial information and information about care is really important, but this is the day-to-day -day stuff. This is quality of life um, and things that we know as a community we can do more to work on. That very concerned and somewhat concerned are very high, extremely high. Okay, everybody, I'm going to let you now drink alcohol. Thank you so much for day one, uh, and we'll see you tomorrow.